Okay, guys. So this is this is really important. So if you think about Alzheimer's, and it was ALZ kid because Alzheimer's. I watched a movie over the weekend that was it was actually a snooze fest, but my wife really wanted to watch a movie, and I was like, all right, I'll use my compression hoses on my legs and try to sit still for a minute. Um, but it was with Anthony Hopkins, and it's called Father. And I don't know if any of you have seen that, but it's like basically uh, it's the perspective of a daughter working with her father who's got dementia and Alzheimer's. And it's just really sad to see the unraveling of his memories and and him not being able to sequence things in time and and getting really emotional and then ending up in an institution. I mean, it was just tragic. And so um that old saying uh you know when is the best time to plant a tree uh you know everyone will say oh right now but really the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago right and so with the brain and especially with your patients um right now is the time to start is when they don't have cognitive decline and they're not showing these symptoms that's the best time to start working on brain health and so we're going to talk about that today, and I've got some slides I'll share with you guys. This is from session two that um, we didn't go, we didn't really go over. So, um, so here we go. But just as we begin, how many of you are treating patients who have some kind of cognitive decline? And and how many of you find that, wow, it's, it's challenging once they get there. I know, um, I know many of us uh, have been, you know, caregivers. I know, uh, you know, Dr. Paula, you went through, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of things with your, your own dad um, recently. And, and uh, you know, many of us have patients who have also done this. And I, I remember one of my patients came in and, and he came in with his wife and his wife was just overwhelmed. And she said, man, I, I cannot like, I'm like uh, Theodore was his name, Theodore. He won't, he's now becoming obstinate. He won't get dressed. He doesn't know how to put on a shirt. He can't take a shower. Um, you know, I don't want to put him into a nursing home and a, and a you know, uh, a care facility um, because I just don't feel like that's the right thing to do. I feel it's almost uh, inhumane. I won't be able to oversee them. And there's so much abuse that happens in those facilities. She was nervous. And, and, uh, and so what, what she ended up doing is we ended up treating this patient and doing some of our regenerative medicine, doing our intranasal treatment on him. We did peptides and he went from being obstinate um, to being able to function where he could do three or four steps sequentially. So he could get dressed, for example, he could change the water pressure and the water temperature. And this was a couple of years ago and we treated him about every six months. And, and that's been able to keep him uh, to the place where his caregiver actually has some capability of not, not having to stress over all those little things. And so, so I think this is a, a much bigger problem than we realize. And a lot of us, you know, it's not like we can, uh, you know, do any marketing like, Hey, we can treat your Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I wouldn't recommend that. That's a quick way to get a letter from your state board or the FDA. But I think there's some things we can absolutely do um, to help these patients uh, with these issues. So um, the biggest threat uh, for someone over 80 is not the threat of heart disease or even cancer or even diabetes. It's actually Alzheimer's. And so um, three out of five Americans will suffer from a nervous system disease such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. That's, that's more than half of the population. This is according to the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation. And so um, I think that uh, it's a problem that is worth spending a little time on because because Cade, when you saw our grandmother, uh, you know, you were, let's see, when, when uh, Grandma Hunt was in a facility there in Delta, you were still a teenager, what, 15 when she, when she went in? Uh, 17. So she, I was, um, yeah, I was a senior in high school when she came to live with us. And that was, um, yeah, it was, it was sad because um, I think at first it was the plan was she was going to just live at home. And I think after about a week, we realized that was not doable because we had those two stairs and you had to walk upstairs just to get to a bathroom um, in that house. And so that was that was not going to um, work out. 
Um, yeah, but it was, it was, um, yeah, really, really tough. Man. Yeah. Really hard to see it. And, and so, um, you know, let's, let's just think about our own brains right now. How many of you have noticed some cognitive decline lately? <laughs> so, or how many of you have had your spouse or your team complain that, you know, I think you're not all there. And there's, I, I think the biggest risk that many of us have right now is this thing called digital dementia. And Kate, have you ever been around someone who's got digital dementia? Or do you know what it is? It, I, I have a suspicion. I've, I've heard the term. I don't know exactly how to define it other than uh, you're just uh, got brain fog like crazy because you've been staring at your phone all day. Yeah. Computer. Yeah. Yeah. And digital dementia is when you're so distracted, you know, you're in a conversation with somebody, but you're checking tags, you're looking at emails. And I think we're all guilty of it where, where we just, you know, we can't formulate any thoughts on our own anymore. And the other version of digital dementia is when, you know, think about how many phone numbers that you can memorize right now that, you know, off the top of your head. I mean, there's probably like less than a handful Whereas when I was a kid, I had so many phone numbers memorized. I mean, it must have been 40 or 50 phone numbers memorized. It was no big deal. Um, so, so digital dementia is a real thing. Uh, it looks like Dr. Underwood, yeah, Parkinson's. Um, Dr. Paula, vascular dementia is what her father had. So, um, so, so challenging. And, and so there's not only is there, you know, a, a healthcare crisis when we look at pain, you know, the opiate crisis, when we look at the pandemic, this crisis in immunity and, and compromised immune systems, we look at the diabetes crisis, the diabetes crisis, you know, with diabetes and obesity, um, these things are real. But the, the other crisis that we don't talk a lot about is the crisis of brain health. And, and the crazy thing is um, that this, this creates so much strife in the family. And you could see in the movie, father, which, uh, you know, I'd recommend it. It's an interesting movie. It's, it's really compelling, uh, just to see all the emotional dynamics that go on with somebody who's got, uh, dementia, you know, how it impacts everyone. I mean, he was always claiming that his caregiver stealing his watch. Um, you know, he was paranoid half the time and then he could be charming and turn it on and then manipulate a situation and then get really mean and aggressive. Um, just kind of like this meme refuses a bath all week and then complains to family that she has not been given a bath. So then the family is like, well, well, what's going on? Is she, is there elderly abuse? Is this real? Or is it just, um, you know, the dementia speaking. And so here's another meme for you. Am I the only millennial around here taking care of a parent with dementia? Because this is a big deal because more and more people are living to the age of 80. And uh, Kate and I just celebrated our grandmother's 90th birthday and really exciting. I mean, she turned 90 in March, but uh, with everything going on with uh, the vid, she pushed it until July 4th and we had a big family reunion. But Kate, I, I'm always impressed that... Um, Verla, I mean, her brain is sharp. Oh yeah, she's um, she's on point. There's no uh, there's no question about it. And so uh, she's you know she's she's kind of the exception. Yeah, I think it's impressive, and I I do I think that you know one one thing that she's had going for her, she's never stopped moving. Um, she does like woodworking. She works with her hands. She works in the yard constantly. She's, you know, she lived on a farm and ate, you know, you know she puts like loads of butter and cream on everything, um, which her, her cooking is fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I think kind of there's some lifestyle components that have contributed to that. You know, maybe some, some better genetics, who knows? Um, but yeah, I, I think um, I, it's super impressive how sharp she is and uh, just how active she is too. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's a variety of things. So, so what we're gonna cover today is we're gonna go through some, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some studies and talk about the three phases of care when it comes to brain health that every single one of you can go through. And, you know, I look in, in Go Wellness and um, man, Dr. Eckel is probably our, our uh, leading authority on this, this topic. 
Um, and so there's so many things you can go back into your, your database and just, you know, look at what he's done. He, he ran the brain regeneration summit recently, and that was very exciting. Um, but, but let's talk about some, some of the three phases of care, because every one of you, I think we can always increase our knowledge of this and increase our ability to help patients. But I'm seeing a lot more patients, uh, come in that don't complain of cognitive decline because we're not marketing it. Um, but I do believe that every single patient, one of the reasons our five core pillars of health, one of the core pillars is brain health. But, you know, once again, the best time to treat it is 20 years before any symptoms show up. So, um, so if there are symptoms, you're already too late. Um, but you can, obviously you can stop the progression, but it's really difficult to turn it around entirely. So, so here's a study um, where they, they looked at cholesterol levels. And this is kind of an interesting one because one of the triggers that we're finding is a, an external trigger that can easily be removed. And that is you, the use of statins. So, so here's the study. They, they found low levels of high density lipoproteins or, or HDL the good cholesterol in the middle age may increase the risk of memory loss and lead to dementia later in life. So looking at your, your low, low levels of HDL is a big indicator is what they found in dementia. So we also know that low levels of HDL and high levels of triglycerides, that shows that there's some insulin resistance going on. Um, if you guys read uh, Why We Die um, by Benjamin Bickman, it's a good refresher on all the insulin resistance because a lot of, uh, you know, the cognitive decline and dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, it might be like type 3 diabetes in the brain. And so this study was published in uh, Arterial Sclerosis, Thrombosis, and Vascular Biology um, Journal of the American Heart Association. They observed 3,673 3, participants 27% approximately women from the Whitehall 2 study. Researchers found that falling levels of HDL cholesterol were predictors of declining memory by the age 60. Whitehall, which began in 1985, has a long-term health examination of more than 10,000 British civil servants working in London. So look at HDL markers. So one of the things you can use to remove inflammation, because part of the part of the reason why we have uh, HDL that gets lower is our body just is it gets too inflamed. Our livers can't process enough of the HDL cholesterol. LDL levels start to rise. And so one of the things you want to do is get rid of that inflammation, correct the liver. I think a good liver cleanse for your patients twice a year is one of the best things you can do. Put them on a 14 day liver cleanse. Uh, you can, you guys have that in your, in your database. You can also get it out of my book, your health transformation. I believe it's page 97 is where it starts. Um, but there's a really exciting new peptide is J147. And it's a curcumin-based peptide. And, and uh, Kate, you use a lot of the, uh, the curcumin um, and, uh, you know, from, from uh, Apex. What's that one called? The, uh, the real yellow, the Tumero. Um, that's, I know that's a, the Tumero is one of your favorites, right? Oh, yeah. The, the Apex, uh, Tumero, um, along with Reserva, uh, Resvero. Um, with the resveratrol, um, love that combo. Yes. Yeah. Really good way of just getting rid of the inflammation. So it's good too. Tastes really good. Easy to get your kids to take it. Um, you know, remember in the morning when cortisol is higher, your body's cleaning out a lot, a lot of the inflammation. So really good to use it in the afternoon or the evening, um, because your body's already kind of in that flushing cycle. And so you don't want to go too anti-inflammatory, in the morning, if you're doing this, um, you know, from a uh, preventative state. Um, so uh, it, this particular peptide, the J147, it was developed for the use of treating neurodegenerative conditions associated with aging. You guys know uh, curcumin, that's the main active polyphenol in turmeric and ginger. It can cross the blood brain barrier, unlock curcumin alone and induced neuronal stem cell production. Safe in animal studies, 
um, it's orally active. So uh, really, a, you know, this will be a powerful peptide that is not fully manufactured yet. It's still being primarily used in laboratories, but I can see this one as being, um, it, it's going to be a top shelf peptide in the next couple of years. Uh, J147, you guys are going to learn all about the mitochondria in session three. You'll want to be there in person if you can make it because we're going to have all these cool little uh, breakouts and uh, activities. But, uh, but J147, what they found is it increased mitochondrial function by improving ATP levels. It inhibited ATP synthase, specifically ATP5A. Um, it reduced toxic metabolites. Um, it also allows for a healthier, younger mitochondria on a molecular level by modulating the AMPK and mTOR pathway. Two of our favorite pathways, turn up the juice and calm it down. That's your yin-yang pathway. Fruit flies that were given J147 had a longer lifespan, 9.5 to 12.8% due to the effects on the mitochondria. So, um, and we lost Dan. I was going to ask him about mitochondria, what he thought on that, but uh, but J147 reverses cognitive impairment in the mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. It improves amyloid beta metabolism and reduces levels in the brain by reducing the protein levels of the beta secretase. Um, ADJ147 protects against the blood brain barrier permeability, homeostasis, and improves vascular function in the brain. It also increases levels of DHA and glutamate levels. So just a phenomenal peptide. Keep on the lookout for this. I've been in contact with Justin Kirkland. And so um, this will be a fun peptide in the future. It's shown to decrease blood glucose, hemoglobin A1C levels by increasing AMPK. Kay, do you happen to know what other peptide increases AMPK? It's one of our favorites. Um, C. That's it. Well done. Yes. Yeah, Mod C. Pop <laughs> quiz past. Yeah, but that's one of the reasons you notice so much energy when you take it. You're like, oh man, it just, it funnels the glucose where it needs to go and it triggers those GLUT4 transporters so that you can actually utilize glucose without the presence of insulin. So love it. Yeah, me too. Helps uh, improve anxiety levels. It fights pain and neuropathy. Um, it was shown effective in treating diabetic neuropathy. Uh, and I know you guys had a great uh, uh, webinar with Dan talking about neuropathy a couple of weeks ago. It's just phenomenal. Um, it improves diabetes induced motor nerve dysfunction, peripheral sensitivity and pain levels. And it does not necessarily need brain derived nootropic neurotropic factors to be neuroprotective. So, so you can do it without the presence of BDNF, but exercise is your best way to improve BDNF. So uh, with any nootropic, I like to add exercise in with it. J147, the good news for your patients who do have issues exercising, um, they're not your biohackers, uh, they'll still benefit from this. Uh, it also reduces uh, neurons glutathione depletion. Um, That's why I love the glutathione spray, the glutostat, so nice. Um, and it's neuroprotective against glucose starvation. Hey everybody, Reagan Archibald here with Go Wellness. And if you liked this episode, if it actually helped inspire you to be a better practitioner, help more people, establish a much better foundation for your business, then I'm going to ask a favor of you. And that favor is to, for you to share this with somebody you care about and love in the healthcare field. I don't mind if it's an acupuncturist, a functional medicine practitioner of any sorts, a naturopathic doctor, a medical doctor, any type of endocrinologist or specialist, we need to get this community strong and we can't do it without your help. So I wanna thank you from the bottom of, of my heart for all the hard work you're putting in day in and day out. I know it can be a grind, especially with some of the chronic cases that you're treating, but this show will help transform the way that you think, help transform the way you practice and change the lives of thousands. Thank you for being part of our community.